Hey, Laura, I've got some good news and some bad news. Oh, no, Luke. Hit me with the bad news first. Well, 41% of employees plan to leave their jobs this year, according to a Mercer survey. Oof, that is rough. What's the good news? Well, good news is that companies with an engaged workforce are 21% more profitable. And companies that lead in customer experience have 60% more engaged employees, according to a State of the American Workforce Gallup study. Wow. You know, it's funny because it, it kind of makes sense because, you know, when, when people are engaged, they're more productive, they're motivated, and they'll even stick around. They'll stay with the company. Yeah, that's what Centrical is all about. They're on a mission to help companies worldwide create a culture of engagement where employees can continuously learn, develop, and in turn grow and thrive. Hey, Luke, you know what happens when people thrive? The business thrives. Ah, so where can we find out a little bit more about this? Personally, I'd go to www.centrical.com to learn more. I'm Luke Jamison. And I'm Laura Butvinick. And we totally geek out about employee experience. We're on a mission to discover how putting employees at the center of your organization impacts business. So join us as we dive in with thought leaders, employee experts, and the best experience creators. This is Boost, a podcast proudly powered by Centrical. Here are your hosts, Luke and Laura. Hey, and welcome to Boost. We've got an incredible show for you. Let's get our producer Jillian out here to tell us who is joining us in the ring at Boost. Luke, I think you may have had a spoiler of who our guest is today because our guest this episode is an international speaker, writer, and a famous podcaster, but more on that later, definitely. Renzo Uzura is the Global Contact Center Management Training and Design Lead for MasterCard, helping to manage and train the global teams behind the MasterCard brand. So he has a ton to share with us about how to bridge cultural gaps and ensure that every employee feels engaged and excited in their training programs. I think this is going to be a really good one today, you guys. Are you excited? I am super excited that we've got someone who's so focused on training. I'm ready to talk some shop. Laura, this is like your episode. This is your bread and butter. Me and Renzo, that's what it's going to be about. (laughs) One thing about Renzo that he loves to talk about when it comes to training is his excitement for personal brand. And I'm sure we'll touch on that today. But I thought it would be fun to kick off this episode with a new little game around personal branding. Are you guys down for it? Oh, yeah, let's go. I'm down. I'm a little nervous. The way this game goes is that I'm going to ask each of you to come up with your two worded personal brand for yourself. So Laura... We will start with you. What is your two-word personal brand? Jillian, that is so evil because I need at least three years to think about this question. (laughs) So I'm just going to go with the first two words that pop out of my head. I'm going to say unabashedly geeky. And that is something I have not always felt, but I'm now more unabashedly geeky. And proud of it. I like it. When did you embrace the unabashedly geeky side of you? This is great. Um, I think it actually was kind of recently. It was during COVID when I think everyone was just kind of reflecting on things going on. And I was like, you know what? I am who I am. And I will also say the first time I met one of my coworkers in person, she actually asked me, hey, Laura, how long have you been a geek? And that actually made me so happy. I was like, you see me. Incredible. Okay, Luke, what is your two-worded personal brand? I'm going to go with well-behaved larrikin. What was that second word? I thought you might ask about that word. Uh, Larrikin is a very Australian word, meaning that they have a disregard for convention, Uh, maybe seen as a maverick, unorthodox, independent-minded, mischievous but good-hearted. Luke, I feel like you are Australian just because that word exists because I feel like that word describes you perfectly. <laughs> I don't think we have anything in America that sums it up as well. Nice. Oh, I'm hoping the rest of the world picks that word up now. Boost vocabulary lesson. All right, I loved hearing your two-word personal brands. Thanks for playing a new game with me. You can take it from here. Thanks, Jillian. Thanks, Jillian. Please give a very warm welcome to Renzo Uzua. Yeah. Woo. 
I feel like we are at a wrestling match right now. Luke, you, you have a future in uh, announcement. The mic's coming down the wrong way. It needs to drop down from the sky. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, welcome, Renzo, to our little variety show. Um, so I want to kick off with the questions in our conversations with a very important one, which is, you know, we have our variety show here. And so I want to ask, what would you perform at a variety show? Do you have any special skills or go-to party tricks that you want to bring out today? Oh, um, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked that. But if I did have the opportunity, uh, I'm actually a a pretty good singer, uh, if I do say so myself. So I'd probably rock out like an Elvis tune or or something like that um, to croon the people and, you know, keep them entertained but yeah i go all right for singing so that would be my talent that's for sure nice what is your go-to karaoke song oh probably uh i'd have to say at the moment it would be k-san uh because it's easy to sing and everybody will join in k-san of course being a, a an old cold chisel classic very Australian. Very Australian. Yeah. Very Australian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody w- would be able to sing. So hopefully I'd get kind of drowned out with uh, everybody joining in. That is strategic. I like that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> that is good because you are our first Aussie on this podcast as well. I've been the token Aussie all season. So, you know, time to represent, mate. Absolutely. That's it. Renzo, uh, you've been heading up training and coaching programs for years. And actually, I also work in training, so I'm really excited to talk today. And something that I've heard from a lot of folks that do work in training is they come from all sorts of backgrounds. And sometimes you didn't even know that this career path existed. I know I felt that way. This is a whole new world when I first started training. Uh, So how did you get into it? And what drew you to training and learning? I started many years ago, uh, many, many years ago, working for a company called General Electric uh, Money um, here in Australia. And I was a team leader in GE for a while, you know, managing customer service teams. But there was something about training that always intrigued me. And we had some great trainers in GE at the time. And one day I just asked, you know, if they needed help with any training, things like that, just to, you know, kind of dip my toe in. And it kind of progressed from there. And being in a company for 16 years, I, for the majority of that time, for about eight of those, I was in training and I really enjoyed my time. So love it. I was able to train teams in in Brisbane, in Melbourne, in Sydney. So I got to do a bit of travel as well. Um, I just loved interacting with people and just seeing the the progression and, and seeing them grow. There's so much to training, especially, you know, with soft skills and leader management and things like that. So G gave me that opportunity to train not only agents, but leaders as well. So loved it from there. And uh, it's been a great passion of mine. And since I've progressed um, to other companies, I've definitely gotten more involved um, on from a global aspect as well which is absolutely fascinating. What do you think you were able to bring from being this team leader into then transitioning into training and maybe looking at at training from this more holistic view? Were there certain skills that really helped you there? I think the great thing about coming from a from a team lead position into training was knowing exactly what to train. Pretty much nutting out the the important components to training. In a lot of training programs, there is a lot of, you know, this is what we do and this is how this works, but is it really necessary for the agent or the frontline agent to to know that information? So it was able to give me an idea of, you know, what's important to an agent from from a team leader perspective and what they need to be trained on and what are the most important things that you should be training on and focusing on rather than the nice to know aspect of it of the company and things like that, because there's a lot of induction and training programs that talk about, you know, this is the company and this is how we we do things. And is it really necessary to to actually train the agent on that? Or are they really going to care at the end of the day? What they care about is their specific job and their specific role. So if you kind of build your training 
more so around you know what the end game is or you know the KPIs and things like that what they need to achieve and cut out the noise then you know you'll get a more streamlined training program for the agents that'll be definitely more efficient for them totally I, I think that's something that I always love hearing from people that work in in training is just what is your background and like what can you bring from that background into training I know for me I started my, my first job in like customer support and ticketing. And that also created this, all right, I need to just know what I need at that moment for my work and cut through that noise, like you're saying. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of companies, they do input a lot of information that isn't necessary. Um, but if you've got someone that's actually in the role and knows exactly what the ins and outs are, then, you know, you have that unique advantage where, like you mentioned, you know, cut out the noise is, is very important and just give the information that the agents need to know for their role and yeah, help them succeed in that way. Yeah. And I suppose that helps probably keep people engaged, right? With training, because that's not always the easiest thing to do. Exactly. Especially coming from a global perspective, it's fascinating working with the global teams as well and how you train training programs across different languages. So there's the language aspect that has to come into play as well, but also the cultural aspect too, that not a lot of people actually realize that depending on the culture or depending on the, the region that you're in, you know, they do things a little bit different, right? So it's not a one size fits all approach that you have to take into consideration. You have to also really base your training on the cultural aspect. In some parts of the world, agents are a little bit more reserved. So how do you bring them out of their shell to be these agents that kind of mimic or are similar to other agents around the world? You have kind of like this streamlined approach of, you know, agents doing the same things, but the cultural aspect is, is quite big as well. And not a lot of people realize that. Totally. That's a huge thing. And so I, I'm hearing two, two different things. There's kind of the engagement, how do we make it engaging? And then this other part of how do we make it engaging to this audience specifically where it's relatable? Right, exactly. I've created soft skill programs or for MasterCard based around how do you engage customers in, in certain situations. In some cultural regions, the empathy aspect is lacking. And it's not through fault of the agent. It's just, you know, in some of the places that we are located, they don't really have and actual cards themselves, you know, cash is still king, right? Um, so they don't necessarily feel what a customer feels when they lose their card and they're traveling overseas. You know, what is it like to lose a card, for example, in Italy or, you know, because you've had your bag stolen or, you know, or you've lost your card in New Orleans and, and things like that, right? So they don't have that travel aspect. So when a customer calls in and you know, is desperate, you know, for help and, and things like that. It's really hard to train that empathy aspect to an agent that doesn't have a card and hasn't experienced that travel and hasn't experienced the desperation that causes when you're traveling overseas. You've got to try and you know, create training based around empathy and make it relatable to them. You know, what would you do if you lost, you know, your favorite pair of shoes or, you know, things like that and, and try and put it in that kind of perspective so they can have a, at least a little bit of an understanding so they don't sound like robots on the call as well, right? We want them to sound as genuine as they can. So what you're saying is during your training at some point, you just steal stuff from them. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good idea. We should, we should consider doing that. Yeah. I like that. It's called like experiential that. learning right there. Right. Right. <laughs> One one thing you and I originally met on the uh, on the grand stage of speaking at conferences, and um, might I just say you are an amazing speaker and always such a big draw card. But um, one of the things I love hearing you speak about, and one of the things that you talk about so passionately is personal branding. I think that's something that we don't talk enough about. I'm curious to know how do you think that. Uh, that personal branding can really help employees find their own personal brand? And how does that help with engagement and, and performance? Personal branding is a big passion of mine. I've created training programs around personal branding. I think it's important for people to recognize that, you know, depending on how they project themselves will be how people perceive them. We can say you work hard and your work will speak for itself. 
but these days it's it's not just the work that you do right it's how you present yourself and you know how you, others see you so i'm very big on the personal branding aspect when it comes to not only training employees but managers as well personal branding these days is about networking and talking to to people so people get to know you outside of your little work bubble because a lot of people are very content with staying in, in their work bubble. But if they want to progress or if they want to, you know, achieve the next role, what they have to start doing is they have to start talking to people outside of their areas and, and networking and asking people in the lift and in the stairwells, you know, hey, um, I'm Renzo and, and what do you do? I do this and, and things like that. And just finding out that talking to people, it's really easy at the end of the day. A lot of people don't necessarily have that personality to go up to someone they don't know and just start talking to them. But you'll find that people are people, right? And normally when people approach you and ask you about your work and, you know, it'll draw them to you, right? People love talking about themselves, especially from a work perspective. Oh, this is what I do and, and things like that. I bring it down to emotional intelligence as well, right? Uh, where People can be quite shy and reserved, but if you know the setting that you're in, right, and, you know, you project yourself in a different way, then that will come naturally to you speaking to, to other people. So I think the personal branding, yeah, is definitely a passion. And like I said, I've created training programs around personal branding for MasterCard that talks about not only your performance, but the way you dress, you know, the image when you have people coming in from overseas or big bosses come in, you know, the way that you dress, the way that they see you, the way that they perceive you is, is very big, you know, for your career development as well. Yeah. So for these training programs that you're doing with MasterCard, how do you see this personal branding really helping employees feel engaged and excited about their work? And also like you're saying, proud of it, excited to share what they're doing. Do you see those types of results coming afterwards? Absolutely. With the people that I've trained on the, the programs, yeah, definitely. It comes down to, you know, understanding what the message is, right? I try and make it, you know, as succinct as, as I can. But there are people that have taken my personal branding training and have completely changed their, I won't say their appearance, but have completely changed the way that they project themselves. They absolutely love it. And it's they've let me know that it's it's definitely changed their mindset in you know how others perceive them so it's worked really well i haven't been able to to train it in other languages around the world but it definitely is a goal of mine to train it in other languages and in other regions but uh, i'm slowly getting there that's for sure i am curious uh, i feel like i've got a, a pretty good good read on you now after all these years but for our audience sake what is your personal brand what I want for people to realize or, or recognize me for more than anything is someone that is able to do the job no matter how hard, no matter how tough it may seem from a training perspective. And I'd be able to deliver it in, in multiple languages as well. I'm, I'm multilingual, right? So I can speak Spanish, understand some Portuguese and, and speak a little bit of Portuguese, but deliver it in such a way that it's engaging. Like, like you mentioned, Luke, um, I'm very passionate about engagement and very mindful of how to keep people engaged when I do speak. I've done it for so long that I think I do a, a pretty good job. You know, I get called to, to conferences, not only here in Australia, but uh, around the world as well. So I've definitely got some, you know, stories to tell and the way I deliver the message is definitely well delivered. That's an awesome personal brand. Renzo, if you don't mind sharing some of your secrets, I want to hear how you really engage with your, your trainees and how do you make sure your message is always getting across to them? The way that I engage, not only the, the trainees, but you engage people in general, especially when you're in speaking assignments and things like that, is tell them a story. People are fascinated by listening to stories and listening to experiences. So over the years, I've been fortunate enough to, to gain a sack full of, of multiple different stories from multiple different regions around the world that I can bring to the table. 
and relate it to to them, right? Relate it to the topic that I'm talking about. So that's what I do. Like I said, people love to hear a story. It takes them back to your childhood. When you were young, your teacher would, would tell you stories or read your books and things like that. So I try and incorporate experiences and stories as much as I can into training. And just like I said, make it relatable to the topic that I'm discussing. And you'll find that people will listen to you, you know, especially when you relate it to the topic at hand. They love a good yarn, that's for sure. Well, speaking of good stories, I think we're all eager to understand and find out a little bit more about your wrestling podcast. Tell us the story about that. Sure. That came all of a sudden one day, probably about two and a half years ago now. We've been doing it for for almost three years, where a friend of mine just one day straight up asked me, hey, um, I'm thinking about doing a podcast about wrestling. What do you think? And I was like, oh, my God, really? that sounds amazing. I know wrestling. And he was kind of shocked. He was like, really, you know, wrestling? I was like, yeah, I know, you know, a lot of wrestling in Japan. I follow a lot of uh, Japanese wrestling, which is a lot different to to the stuff that's out in the States and Mexico. And he's he's kind of a, an expert in the wrestling world from, from Mexico, the, the Lucha Libre style. So with a friend in Chile, we actually just decided to one day start recording us just talking about wrestling and almost three years later we're still recording Uh, you can listen to our podcast in all of the the major platforms it's called lucha hsp which stands for lucha house party we try and have a bit of a party when we we talk about wrestling Uh, and it's it's cool because we've got listeners from all around the world that that listen to us you know people in in japan itself um in Singapore, we had got people in the Ukraine as well. And so it, it, even though it's in Spanish, I think a lot of people that listen to us from other countries are also trying to learn the language as well. But we were voted for the Latino Podcast Awards last year for the first time. We were up against podcasts from ESPN and Telemundo and Fox Sports. That's yeah, a yeah, huge feather in your seats. cap. Congrats. Yeah, well <laughs> Thank done. you. Thank you. Lorenzo, I do have to ask real quick, does wrestling ever make its way into your training? Like, do you ever see them uh, fusing together ever? There is moments that I bring in some wrestling stories into some of the training. Not often, but I do, especially when there's we talk about conflict resolution and things like that. There are moments when I do talk about wrestling and kind of, like you said, fuse them together, but uh, not very often, but definitely in conflict resolution, that's for sure. Yeah, I would say that is engagement and that is storytelling right there. Yeah, don't call MasterCard because they're they learning to like wrestle you now. Wrestle. No, that's, that's <laughs> exactly. conflict resolution. Oh, I, I don't mean that. All good. All ah. right, Renzo, do you have time to stick around for just one more segment of our variety show? Sure, absolutely. Would love to. Awesome, Luke. I think it's time for a little uh, a little game. little fate of the eight. Fate of the Eight, where we look into the Magic 8-Ball to decide our fate. Will it be a question or will it be a game? Uh, we, we can never figure out what we you know, want to do more, ask a series of questions or play a game. So we usually ask the Magic 8-Ball what we're going to do. So, so Laura has her Magic 8-Ball and we're going to find out. Mr. 8-Ball or Mrs. 8-Ball, will we be asking Renzo a question? Or non-binary 8-Ball. All 8-Balls here are welcome. <laughs> It is certain. All right. Um, We're going to grab a question from our question bag over here. And Renzo, who is your favorite pro wrestler at the moment and why? Wow. There's so many. But if there is one, there is a kid uh, who's about 24 years old. His name is Sammy Guevara. The drive that this kid has, the motivation, the tenacity. He has been wrestling since he's about 16 years old. And he... Uh, does a weekly vlog and he just records his journey. So since he was about 16, he's recorded his journey and just the highs and the lows that this kid has gone through. And at 24, he's lived many, many lifetimes. Thank you so much for being part of this uh, little variety hour. Before we get out of here, uh, let's just make sure that everyone knows where they can find you, where they can catch more of Renzo. Absolutely. I'm accessible through LinkedIn. 
So if you want to connect through LinkedIn, happy to connect. But also don't forget that we have a wrestling podcast in, in Spanish called Lucha HSP, which is available on all major platforms. So you can check me out there as well. And most importantly, what is your number one rule for employee engagement? To care, just a little bit of care when you're dealing with customers and not only customers, but also people, right? Care about them as humans and, you know, try and understand the situations that they're in, get to know them. So you can try and understand what drives them, what motivates them, because that's really important. All right, Laura, that was so much fun. Let's get straight into mind blown moments. Mine was just clearly that he has a wrestling podcast. Okay, not really, but my mind blown moment really was about how he introduces stories into uh, training and, and not just like doing a IE story and training, but like really steering into that and making the training a story and telling that story. That That's so cool. What about you? I also love that, Luke. But I have to say my mind blown moment, and you might be able to tell this by the way I was totally thrown up by Jillian's question at the beginning of this interview, but I loved how he talked about bringing personal branding into training. I have just never really thought of that angle or, or that idea when it comes to training. Super cool. Super interesting. Yes. Yeah, super interesting. Awesome. Hello, I'm Luke. Goodbye, I'm Laura, and thank you so much for joining us. For more content that will help you elevate your employee experience and performance, you can find us at centrical.com forward slash boost podcast. Boost. Hey, it's producer Jillian. I wanted to take a second to invite you all to Centrical's virtual event, Success 2022. This year's event explores how an employee first approach to business success is the only way forward in today's workplace. At Centrical's annual event, you'll hear how leading organizations are making strategic investments in their people through technology to drive purpose and belonging, inspire and support their growth, and maintain connection no matter where they are. Together, let's be bold and rebuild the future of work. Visit events.centrical.com forward slash success 2022 to learn more and to register. Oh, uh, you're still here. We thought the audience had cleared out. Well, lucky you. You've stuck around for the encore. Here are the fun moments that didn't make the main stage cut. Curious about the Elvis thing quickly, because I'm a big Elvis fan. I used to be a baker pastry chef, and the boss I had at the time was a big, big Elvis fan, and so he played it every single night for pretty much four years of my life. And by the end of that, I loved Elvis. I didn't at the beginning. What's your favorite Elvis song? I love uh, Fools Such As I. Now and then there's Fools Such As I. I think in that song, you can really hear his vocal range. He's got a really deep kind of intro to that song. And you can really hear his voice ebb and flow. And he just sings it so naturally. Recently, I came across some outtakes of that recording where he actually sung that. And there's about four or five versions that he recorded that actually sound better than the one that he released. So if you have an opportunity, Luke, uh, look for uh, now and then there's a fool such as I recording outtakes. It is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Well, I want to start a, a boost Spotify playlist now. That was such a nice like explanation of why that song is so great. Absolutely. Sure, that that sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Done. That is the first on our on our official podcast list.